Welcome everyone to today's Synergist webinar, Why is FRAR Compliance So Difficult? I'm Kay Bechtold, Senior Editor of The Synergist, the magazine of the American Industrial Hygiene Association. I'd like to thank all of our attendees and especially Bulwark Protective Apparel for sponsoring today's webinar. Our speaker today is Derek Singh, who has been involved with the flame-resistant clothing industry in a variety of roles for over 20 years. In his current position as a technical training manager, Derek has developed over 40 hours of training curriculum for the Bulwark Institute. These training efforts cover all aspects of FR clothing and focus on helping individuals and companies understand thermal hazards and how to properly design and implement an FR clothing program. And now I'll turn the presentation over to Derek. Thank you, Kay, for that kind introduction. And, uh, Good morning and or good afternoon to those who are on live, and I certainly appreciate you taking time out of your valuable day to talk a little bit about why flame-resistant clothing and arc rating clothing compliance is a little bit difficult. Or are we participating in complicating these things? So before we get started, uh, let's take care of the attorneys. Uh, this presentation is for informational purposes only. Customers of Bulwark Protection are solely responsible for conducting their own hazard risk assessment to identify safety hazards in their work environment. Customers of Bulwark Protection are solely responsible for selecting appropriate garments and protective gear for their employees and ensuring wearers use the garments and protective gear properly and in conjunction with appropriate gloves and footwear. Because working conditions and other factors may vary, Bulwark Protection does not make any representation that these garments of protective gear will protect wearers from injury. And there we go, we're off. So the premise that we get a lot when we're out and in the field is questions in and around how to properly wear flame-resistant arc-rated clothing and questions such as what is better, task-based or daily wear, and then how do we ensure our people will wear their FRAR clothing? Bottom line, what they're asking is, is how can I get my people to stay compliant in their PPE? So in our short time today, what are some of the things you can expect to take away? First, we'll talk a little bit about what the resistance to flame-resistant and arc-rated clothing is. Uh, what are some best practices to, to improve buy-in to your flame-resistant arc-rated clothing program, and how flame-resistant arc-rated science is leading uh, to help with compliance, aka making it more comfortable, and what are some of the pros and cons between daily wear and task-based programs and things to look out about, and then how not to complicate this stuff. So I've used a couple of acronyms so far, uh, flame-resistant and arc-rated. What do I mean by that? Well, all arc-rated clothing, by definition, first has to meet flame-resistant requirements. So flame-resistant is a big, broad uh, definition of clothing. Clothing that self-extinguishes uh, will not melt, drip, and add to the injury. We have that. And then arc-rated means it's had additional testing to uh, withstand an, an arc flash hazard and communicate certain information to you, how much will it insulate to, how much energy will it take before it break open. So all arc-rated clothing is flame-resistant, not all flame-resistant clothing is arc-rated. So moving on, uh, we get resistance primarily, what's the big one, that big elephant in the room? It's too hot. Then we hear, well, because it's heavier, uh, it makes it uncomfortable. And then you guys don't really design all this stuff so well, so it doesn't really fit well, so I'm not comfortable wearing it. And what does that pushback tend to do to our safety professionals? Just put it on then when you need it, because I'm a safety guy, I'm not an electrician, you're the expert, put it on when you need it. Or just put it on when you go on site. Other than that, I don't want to hear about it because why? As safety professionals, we have a catalog of things to go through, A to Z, 1 to 100 every single day, and I don't want to hear you keep chatting about your FRAR clothing. So what does that mentality tend to do? Well, really, when we say put it on when you need it, that tends to, for example, create a hot kit. I have my hard hat, my face shield, my rubbers, my leathers, my insulated tools, and my arc-rated clothing all in the kit. 
and I'm going to put it on when I need it. So the biggest pushback is it's too hot. Well, I'm already wearing 100% cotton uh, work clothing. I've got my denim, my cotton work shirt or t-shirt that I'm going to then don this coverall on over top of. So if it's already hot and I'm putting on an additional layer, I'm compounding that. Secondly, I'm now putting on more PPE over top of my all day, every day wearing apparel. So it's going to be heavier and coveralls don't tend to lend themselves to be a flattering fit. So that strategy in and of itself has now hit all three resistors of why this stuff is uncomfortable to wear to begin with. So how do I, what is the best way to encourage compliance when hot is the primary pushback? The short answer, and it's not the easy answer, but it's the short answer, is wear trials and training. What do I mean by that? Get your people involved during the hottest part of the year and have them try out the latest and greatest. And any good uh, supply chain partner will be able to work with you and make that happen. But also understand you've got some uh, statistics and some power on your side when it comes to just about the truth about heat stress. Both NIOSH and OSHA will tell you that single layer Flame-resistant arc-rated clothing does not trap heat or restrict heat removal any more than regular non-FR clothing. Why is that? Because when we're talking about single layers, heat is shed primarily by evaporation of sweat. Restriction or loss of that function is primarily due to physiological conditions, a.k.a. I'm dehydrated or uh, I'm out of shape or I have meds that I'm taking to interfere with that, or when it comes to the clothing piece, we've introduced a barrier or multiple rare layers. Where do we see barriers? Uh, soil protection, things like Tyvek, Tycam, uh, the elements come into play. Yes, we can have rain on hot days, so you're putting on your flame-resistant arc-rated rain gear. That's a barrier. And then multiple layers when we're climbing into arc flash suits or what I just described to you in a task-based approach. All of those definitely can contribute to heat stress and then perpetuating that this stuff is uncomfortable and hot. So how do then do I convince my people to tuck things in, roll things down, and button them up, a.k.a. wear your PPE properly? It's not going to work, and it's not going to be effective if you do not deploy it correctly. That comes along with training. That comes along with analogies and examples of where that uh, mental approach to PPE can fail us. Uh, we've seen that prior. Anytime you're introducing new PPE, when we first introduced safety glasses into our plants, we'd see safety glasses on the head, safety gas glasses turned around backwards, sitting on top of ball caps or hard hats or tucked in our pockets. Hearing protection, one cup up, we would see our earbuds down around our necks. It takes time to change culture. That being said, though, you have all your standards all reflect the same message. Whether you are uh, in a flash flyer hazard or an arc flash hazard, all our nationally recognized consensus standards are going to support you in stating that you have to wear this stuff properly. That means they need to be buttoned up to the neck, sleeves rolled down, cuffs buttoned, uh, and shirts tucked in. NFPA 70E directly for our general industry electricians tells us exactly how to interface a shirt and pant. ASTM 1506 uses the term properly interfaced. Shirts and pants are designed to be tucked in. Our flash fire standards in NFPA 2113, your playbook, your go-to to implement that, when a shirt, pant, pair of trousers, both are flame resistant or worn together, the shirt shall be tucked in. So you do have the benefit of your standards echoing what you need to be echoing on that plant for. Are there new materials coming forward today that can help me, help my people be compliant? Absolutely. Everything is trending in that direction. Uh, 
we as manufacturers in, in the flame-resistant arc-rated fabrics have been on a quest for really the last 25 years to develop new fiber combinations, what those best ratios are, taking advantage of all the pros of a fiber, minimizing the cons, because again, if there was a perfect fiber fa uh, combination to develop a fabric with, we would be doing it. But it's always a trade-off between protection, comfort, and value. Do we make it too light? that, that it, it doesn't last and your return on investment is bad? Do we make it too light that it doesn't protect? Do we make it uh, uncomfortable by trying to make it lighter and using fully synthetic? So all those challenges bring to bear that we are working on getting you something that's more comfortable. That being said, lightweight, moisture wicking, high air permeability, moisture vapor transfer, all those terms in and of themselves as a single characteristic of a garment, a.k.a. look at this shirt, pant, or coverall, it is lightweight, is not, does not correlate or help when it comes to comfort. Comfort is entirely subjective. If you don't believe me, next time you have your team together and you're in a group environment and you look across the classroom or the meeting room at your team and you're in a controlled environment, ambient air temperature is between 67 and 72 degrees. What do you see in front of you? When people are given the choice on what to wear, you will see a variety. You will see t-shirts, uh, you'll see sleeves rolled up, you will see slightly unbuttoned completely, but you'll see people layering, you'll have t-shirts underneath long sleeve button downs, you'll have hoodies, sweatshirts, and combinations of all of the above, and everybody, I'm going to assume, in a voluntary environment is going to be comfortable. So what does all that mean? When we look at combining characteristics, the keys when you look at comfort and what aids in comfort is I want to be dry and I, don't, and I want to not carry around a lot of weight. So we want to have high airflow, and we want to have moisture wicking. Moisture wicking pulls that moisture from our body, keeping it dry. Airflow allows us to feel a sense of cooling down. We combine those two, and then we add into that reduction of weight, we can get to something that is going to increase compliance. Now, as easy as that sounds, it's not easy to accomplish. Lightweight is great, but remember the key function of flame resistant arc rated clothing is what? To protect you in a thermal environment. So I am tasked by first and foremost protecting you. Comfort, if I can get there, great. And value, if I can give you an ROI for those expensive garments, I'm going to attempt to you, but that is in a descending order. The other things we look at, so if we open up the weave, we give you more airflow, remember, we still have to stop thermal energy coming through. Uh, moisture wicking, we don't want to have that as a treatment, we want to have that as inherent function of the fibers, we want fibers to remove moisture from our body and then fibers to push moisture out into the atmosphere so I can help cooling you down through evaporations. All those things may sound like, well, we can do that in non-FR, I can do that at retail, I can go to my performance fibers in my store, why can't we simply give them flame-resistant properties? We are trying. Why? Because compliance starts with the fabric. Before we cut and sew anything into a shirt, pant, and coverall, we're evaluating that fabric's performance. So something that you think of like an open weave, remember, we want to increase breathability or have the ability for air to move through that. That's good, but there's also other characteristics we can benefit from. Bigger spaces, we can get dirt and other contaminants out of there easier. But that also goes twofold. If it's too big, it's too much, that's dirt and contaminants that can also get in. Increase abrasion resistance, increase durability, get a superior ROI from that garment. Sounds excellent, but remember, when we toughen stuff up, we could potentially stiffen it up also. Not very comfortable in wearing. 
Moisture wicking, we want to make sure that that's not a finish. Why? We don't want to have anything that's only going to last for a limited period of time. One of the things you'll notice that all moisture wicking treatments last about 25 lawn drinks. You're going to wear your flame-resistant arc-rated clothing more than 25, so all that advantage that you paid for is going to be gone in about six months. So you want it to be part of the fibers, not a finished. Enhanced protection. We are revolutionizing FR chemistry to the point to where we're enhancing how those fibers work. What I want to do is I want to get a lightweight 5-ounce fiber to act like a 7.5, 8-ounce fiber in a thermal event. But when it's not exposed to thermal energy, it's going to continue to be 5 ounces. Hence, there we have some lightweight there. Now we add in moisture wicking uh, fibers and we open up the weave a little bit, we are closely getting there. Because ultimately, we want to create true performance workwear for that occupational athlete, and that will drive compliance. As I've said earlier, look deeper into the brochure. If, if your selling point is it's lightweight, that in and of itself is not an indicator of comfort. What else is going to complement that to make sure it protects and it adds value and it's going to be something that can uh, last for some time? Uh, air perm alone, along with lightweight, is not an indicator of comfort. Why? One of the greatest air permeability things is look at the old-fashioned screen door. I mean, I grew up with a screen door stopping insects from coming in. Air would flow through Faraday, and I wouldn't make a garment out of screen door material. So, again, large air permeability, large air perm score. When you see that little pin, uh, ping pong ball floating up on the tube because I'm blowing air through my fabric, in and of itself is not an indicator uh, of comfort. Moisture vapor transfer, great terminology, new buzzwords. It's something that is measurable and actually is a property of the fabric and is not a finish. So look for uh, more science behind uh, whatever these claims are. So what do we see in the marketplace when we're going out and we're visiting our end user computer, uh, community, whether that's in, in, in ArcFlash or FlashFire? Where we see a lot of resistance really is from the waist up. Most pant weight is between 9 and 14 ounces, and we get very, very little pushback. Why? Everybody has grown up wearing 12-ounce denim. From the waist down, we don't notice a lot of these are too hot to wear. But we do get a lot of pushback from the waist up. So what does that lead to? That leads to your task-based solutions. That leads to your pushback from the professionals who have to do the job and management and turns around and says, wear it when you need it. What does that lead to? Potentially overprotecting. Uh, you've got a five calorie hazard and you're climbing into a 12 calorie uh, flash suit. That's the low end, that's a nine ounce coverall, that's what I'm carrying around in my hot kit, and every time I'm going to voltage test, troubleshoot, and verify, I have to climb into my hot kit because that's an energized task, and that's what we have to do. We can be overprotecting. Following the CAT method is very conservative, and if you haven't done your uh, arc flash hazard assessment, if you don't have that engineering done and those panels are not labeled and you use we're cat two on everything out on the floor and then when we get into the switching room we're cat four, that tends to in and of itself be task based and it's going to be conservative and you're going to be overprotecting, meaning you're not going to take advantage of lightweight, more comfortable options. Uh, also, when we are putting stuff over top of what we're already wearing, have we policed every single layer that we're bringing into the work environment? Do we have 100% natural fibers that are going to be underneath that uh, 40 cal flash suit or that CAT2 12 cal coverall? Do I know that I'm not introducing meltables uh, underneath there? That they're, if they're in an incident, even though my outer layer is doing its job and protecting, what's underneath could potentially be hurting me. What are we doing when we go to add additional things like high-vis safety apparel? Uh, think of wet vests. 
think of uh, I need to be seen. Do I don a reflective vest, an ANSI vest, and what are its properties? Could I potentially be compromising my arc rated uh, clothing by what I'm putting on over top of it? Or do in some cases, we just stop at, at, at the hierarchy controls at admin? Where have I seen this happen? You may say, Derek, that, that's highly unlikely. Look at combustible dust hazards. Combustible dust hazards is a flash fire chain reaction hazard. I have an explosion, I have a dust of diffuse, I have diffuse fuel in a dust that is consumed, that causes additional dust to fall. Now I have chain reaction fireballs going through my facility. Most combustible dust hazards, folks, stop at housekeeping. And you'll find very few of our high-risk combustible dust industries having PPE. They don't employ NFPA 2112 compliant flame resistant garments for their people who are exposed to that hazard. We see that all the time. Why? Because in many times we have the mindset, it hasn't happened to us. We've worked here for 25 years. We know what's going on and we haven't had an arc flash, flash fire, combustible dust explosion at all. So what does that mean? Just because nothing bad has happened historically doesn't mean that nothing bad will not happen going forward. Compliance does not necessarily mean you're safe. If you check off the box that all my people have hot kits, all my electricians don their PPE when they do the task, or when they go into this room, they're putting on their PPE, doesn't necessarily mean you're safe. Now, the inverse of that, if you are following safe work practices, if you are following nationally recognized consensus standards, if you are doing the things that are laid out as best practices, then more than likely you're going to be compliant. So where did I go wrong? I have had an incident, my guy got hurt, and we have outfitted them with all their PPE. We unfortunately took a task-based approach. That means I outfitted them with a hot kit. I checked off my boxes. You've got your hard hat, your arc rated face shield, your safety glasses, your hearing protection, your voltage rated uh, tools, uh, your rubber gloves, leather protectors, and your flame resistant arc rated clothing. Box checked. Now someone got hurt. Why? Because someone took a shortcut. Then what? Others saw that person taking a shortcut and nothing happened, so they deemed that that was okay. Then you have new hires, people transferring into the department that see that same behavior, and at the end of the day, you've undermined not only your flame-resistant arc-rated clothing program, you've undermined your safety program. Why? Because unsafe practices have become ingrained in your people. How may that look? Let's say you're an electrical contractor. Let's say you're servicing one of your customers. You park your truck in the parking lot, get into the facility, go to the back, and we know by Murphy's Law that 480 panel, that 200 amp disconnect, whatever that piece of equipment is tripping is as far away when I'm done from my truck and my hot kit than is reasonable. It might be 400 meters away. I've got my voltage meter with me. Do I just open it and voltage test that? Something I've done thousands of times without incident, even though knowingly I've been trained and I've been told that I need to get into my hot kit to do that energized task, or when no one's looking, am I potentially going to shortcut good sound electrical safe work practices? You make the call. It can happen. When doing wrong seems right, or what now has been labeled as normalization of deviance? Yes, it has a term, and there are other terms in there. Unattended blindness, insensitivity to hazards. We do something long enough without consequences, we forget why we should be doing it right in the first place. The normalization of deviance was first coined by Diane Vaughn back when reviewing the Challenger disaster. And if you ever want to take time to have an interesting read in and around very smart people who knew better, who had policies and procedures in place to counter what happened and just didn't do that, very well worth the time. And sensitivity to that occurs over years, it just creeps in to an organization. It creeps into your safety practices. 
and what pushes it? We've got to go faster. It's costing us money. Why are you doing it that way? We don't do it that way here. There's, there's a shorter, quicker, faster way to do it, and it ends up permeating through what we're doing, and that's what we're all tasked with trying to avoid. We coach people on following the hierarchy of controls. Always try to eliminate, substitute, engineer it out. We all know the jargon here. We all know the intent. And then we get down to our PPE. The least effective, but it's your last line of defense. And the key thing here is it does not work if you don't have it or if you aren't wearing it. If there's an arc flash or a flash fire or a thermal event on your facility, in your yard, at some time, believe me, it was unplanned. There are very few planned thermal events in the electrical world and our oil and gas and refinery world. These are accidental, unpredictable. So when do you have to be wearing your safety belt? And if your mindset is only when I get into an accident, it's going to fail. You need to be wearing it all the time so it can do its job of saving your life. I talk to folks, and we get it all the time. In fact, it's so permeant now that our good friends up in Canada, when they cut, lifted, and pasted NFPA 70E into CSA Z462, they added their own piece, Annex Q, which we then in America have taken and added to our own 70E. And it talks about human performance in the work environment. It addresses unique things that we as are intentionally human. People are fallible, and even the best of us are going to make mistakes. Uh, a real easy analogy, you cannot expect your professionals eight hours a day, every day, 260 to 300 days a year to be 100% spot on. We have professional athletes who are highly trained, who focus all day, every day on competing for three and a half hours every afternoon, once a week, and they're fallible. So what is it like to assume that we have to be infallible eight hours a day to 10 hours a day, five days a week? It is a very, very difficult thing to do. As professionals, we have to look at things that can, as human performance indicators, potentially cause risk. And we're identifying those things and we're getting better at it. Things like task demands, time pressure, high workload, work environment, do we have distractions, interruptions, individuals' capabilities, did we just change the equipment, did we upgrade things? John worked on similar equipment, but it's not exactly the same equipment, but I'll figure it out. I'll just get into it and figure it out. So we know that human nature and human performance factor into things all the time, and we're ultimately getting better at that. Where does human show up on the job? The first three indicators, if you look at the light blue, the burnt orange, and the gray, 65% of those, have we ever taken a shortcut? in order to meet a deadline? Have we ever taken a shortcut in order to get things done quicker? We've been doing this for 10, 15 years without incident. We got this nailed. Or, you know what? I know what the book says, but we're just going to do it this way because this is how I've done it. 65% right there, human shows up on the job, and those aren't unreasonable. So when it looks to flame-resistant arc-rated clothing, getting back to specifically what we're doing with our workwear being our PPE, how do we combat human? We take that task-based mentality and we turn it into a daily wear mentality. Why? Even though right now you're saying, Derek, that's going to cause me huge pushback, that's going to cause me people not that's the too hot piece. You're introducing it into my workplace. Exactly. Why? You as safety people now have a baseline of confidence that if I'm wearing my shirt and pant all day, every day, when something goes bad, I have a baseline of protection. I'm going to take clothing ignition out of the equation, 
and I'm going to take something that's potentially fatal and make it 100% survivable. Why? I have my safety belt on. And no matter how bad it is on this side of the windshield, it's better than 25 feet down that asphalt. Ask any highway patrol officer survivability of ejection accidents. It's virtually nil. That safety belt will work, and it will save your life. When we're out in the field training folks and when we're talking about task-based versus daily wear, we can make a real easy analogy. If we're talking about secondary protective clothing, and that's what shirts, pants, and covers, coveralls are for arc flash and, and flash fire protection, then what's primary? The easiest analogy I can make for folks is think of our firefighters. Think of our first responders. Big red truck, flashing red lights, I roll up on a structural fire. I've more than likely donned the upper and lower half of my bunker gear and my special boots. I put my special gloves on, my really cool hard hat, and before I grab my pole axe and voluntarily walk into a burning building, I need one essential key piece of equipment. I need to be, be able to breathe and for long-term thermal exposure. It doesn't matter how good my shirts, pants, and coveralls are. If I can't breathe inside that building, it's not going to do me any good. So I put on my SCBAs, and I voluntarily walk into that burning building. That being said, once I knock the fire down, once it's out, once we're back at the station, do I need to be wearing all that PPE? Absolutely not. Not unless it's rookie hazing night. We know that this is intentional. We are purposely wearing stuff, knowingly going into a thermal event. In our world, the secondary PPE world, when do we have to have it on? These are accidents. I think everybody would clearly say an arc flash or a flash fire in our electrical community, in our oil and gas refining community is accidental. They're unplanned. So do you have time to go get it and put it on? No, you have to have that baseline of protection on all day, every day. So how does noncompliance creep into what I'm calling my world? A picture here, we have a utility lineman on a hot stick wearing perfectly good arc-rated shirt. I'm going to say arc-rated pant, him and his buddy. They've been outfitted by the company. They've probably been trained. Utility guys are some of the most highly trained electrical workers that we have. And how does noncompliance or how do problems creep into my world? Exactly what you're seeing here. Is, is that undershirt that he is exposing to that potential energy, is that even arc rated? I have no idea. Is it equal to the, an estimate of the in, incident energy that he could be exposed to? I have no idea. Is his outer layer going to work to protect him? Absolutely not. That's not how it's designed to be deployed, and that will not protect him. Over here, what's our concern? When we untuck, what are we exposing? Everything that's underneath. How do I say that? Arcs are unpredictable. Just because I'm at chest height or I'm at extended height does not mean that arc will go into my chest. It might go down to the ground. If it hits and mushrooms on the ground, what does the law of thermodynamics tell me about all that heat? It's going to rise up. It's going to blouse that untucked shirt. It's going to go underneath, and it's going to find an ignition point if it can. If that's a lightweight, three-and-a-half-ounce BVD or Fruit of Loom cotton T-shirt, you're going to have a cotton fire underneath your perfectly good flame-resistant arc-rated clothing. As we're getting ready to wrap up here, a couple things I want you to think about as you uh, go back to your facilities. If you currently require uh, high-vis safety apparel, and that comes in the shape of either your rain gear when you're working in inclement weather, you're going to have ANSI-rated uh, rain gear with flame-resistant arc-rated properties, or if you're working roadside and you require your people to don uh, ANSI-rated vests couple things to think about. If your rain gear or your vest are flame resistant and that flame resistant uh, compliance comes by it meeting one standard, 
And how do I know that? I'm going to look in my label, and there's only going to be one standard stated in there. It's not going to have an ARC rating. It's not going to have a uh, independent uh, certification from a organization like UL. It's going to say this meets FR requirements based on ASTM, for example, 2302. That is not even a standalone uh, standard. It's intended to complement and work in conjunction with other standards. Uh, 6413 is not even a performance standard. It's the vertical flame test, and I can get plastic to pass the vertical flame test and state that it self-extinguishes. It's just a gray area slash loophole in that uh, requirement, not as a standalone, no good. 701, we still see that primarily in vests. That's not even a garment stand. It's a linen standard, a drapery standard uh, meant for the hospitality industry to have a fire retardant uh, on those big drapes and linens that you see in, in our hospitality industry. Why? To slow the combustion so I can get from the 10th floor to the parking lot safely. What you want to have on your rain gear and vest is a couple things. Rain gear, 1890, ASTM 1891, that's for arc flash, ASTM 2733 for flash fire. Ideally, I want to have both standards in my rain gear in case I have uh, joint utilities, joint hazards. Bottom line, if your rain gear is flame resistant and it costs you 100 bucks, you got the wrong rain gear. If your rain gear costs you closer to 400, 500 bucks, you probably got the right rain gear. For our vests, and especially in our electrical community, look for ASTM 1506. That's going to have an ARC rating in that, and then you know it's at least been tested uh, to your hazard. There's a couple other caveats uh, in there to ensure that we get that done. Uh, feel free to reach out to me at the end of this. Have my email. We can talk about that. Misleading labels, be very conscious when it comes to our ANSI 107 uh, required garments. ANSI 107.15 did a very, very good job of telling our end user, wearer community, what is FR and what is non-FR. There's six standards that you have to be tested to in order to label yourself as FR. ASTM 6413 is not one of those. I bring that up because we see tons of this stuff claiming to be FR for rain gear and vests. It is not meant to be used in arc flash or flash fire. It is claiming a self-extinguishing component, which is no relation at all to the hazard that you are facing. For example, in this label here, you will see that it claims not to be FR per ANSI 107-2015. Then, down on the right, it says it's FR. So which one is it? Is it FR or is it not FR? Because ASTM 6413 is not a descriptor of FR properties. It is a test that will determine whether it self-extinguishes, is there a char length, or did it burn and have a lot of afterflame. Bottom line, this tells you really nothing about this garment. Also, if you read that fine print, it says the self-extinguishing properties diminish with washing. Hmm, I wear my vest out in the rain a couple times. Is it FR anymore? I don't know. If this was on rain gear, this happens to be a vest, but imagine if this label was on rain gear, which there are versions of it for rain gear, that is rain gear that can't get wet. So be very, very cautious of what you're seeing out there in the marketplace. Simplified. Don't overcomplicate things. What do I mean? Utilize daily wear. Don't get into a task-based program for every day, all day uh, work tasks. For our 2112 community, that's relatively easy. All day, every day on the drilling site or in a refinery, you're going to be in your flame-resistant clothing. Make sure it's appropriate to the hazard. Don't overprotect. Overprotection causes pushback and noncompliance. Make sure you train your people on base layers and what's important. Upgrade to the latest technology. Get with your supply chain partners and get the new latest stuff in there. Evaluate it. And then do a little bit of homework and look out for a subject matter expert that you trust that can come in and get training done for you. So how does that look in our two primary hazards that we're talking about, arc flash and flash fire? In ArcFlash, you can take all the information that they're talking about and boil it down to the simples. 
You know what an arc rating is. Arc rating is measured in calories per centimeter squared. You know what incident energy is. That's what's coming out of that gray box measured in calories per centimeter squared. Have more insulation and protection than incident energy coming out of the box. What does that require you to know? That requires you to know what your incident energy is on those gray boxes in your facility so you can communicate that with those electrical workers so they know what to wear. That way I only have to protect to the hazard. I don't have to protect to an imagined or overprotect to a generalized hazard. That way you can utilize, for example, in 70E, you can utilize the known incident energies and protect accordingly. That's going to put you in the appropriate uh, weight of clothing. That's going to minimize pushback, and that's going to minimize overprotecting. In our flash fire community, look to NFPA 2112 compliant garments. When you see that FR, remember, not all FR is ARC rated. Not all FR is 2112 compliant. Why am I focusing on 2112 compliant garments? Because they've been tested to your hazard. At a bare minimum, we know that they've retained their flame resistant properties through multiple launderings. That's at least 100. They meet the standards of heat transfer performance and thermal state stability, and they have a measured body burn in a single layer fabric test of less than 50%. Based on what we know today, it's been independently verified by a third party. So based on what we know today, that fabric is going to meet those minimal requirements. That is the hazard that you're up against. So my question to you then is if you're not going to use or require 2112 certified garments, what are you willing to work on your site? And really what I'm asking you is where are you going to allow your people to be hurt if you haven't met these minimal standards? So... 2112 compliant garments for our uh, oil and gas and flash fire hazard folks, and uh, we're going to look to greater arc rating than incident energy for our electrical folks. And in today's world, you can get all that in one fabric. You can get all that in one garment. I can be an electrician on a refinery, and I can have the appropriate arc-rated garment and also the appropriate 2112 certified garment. So get your team to buy in. I know we've all seen what does it look when a committee designs anything, and, I, and we pick up that piece of equipment that has hoses sticking out, or in this case, a shirt, pant, or coverall that has all these designs, all these different colors. I understand that committees may not be ideal, but when it comes to compliance and buy-in, forming that cross-section of that FR committee, in my experience over the last 25 plus years, has aided in that buy-in. Then get and select the latest garments for that wear trial. Take time and tour the facilities. Where are they being manufactured? Can I get to the facility where it's being manufactured? Is it within the contiguous United States or in North America? Or am I having to hop on a plane and go find it in order to know where it is? Proper wear trial of garments is not as simple as just putting shirts and pants on people's backs and going, hey, how did you like it? Little things that people, <coughs> excuse me, nuances, that you don't necessarily think about. If I normally wear my Fruit of the Looms or my BVDs underneath my work shirt or coverall, when I wear test that new fabric and I'm wearing my BVDs and my Fruit of the Looms underneath it, what am I wear testing? You're wear testing your BVDs and your Fruit of the Looms. So just things and that short duration uh, wear test, what do we want to look for? Make sure you're working with folks that are experienced in doing it. Then include all your outerwear, all your rainwear, and all your high-vis stuff that could uh, be accessories in that, even looking to headgear along those places. Select a choice program. People love choice, and that doesn't mean that you are, have to forego your industrial laundry. If you have environment, people that get dirty, you don't want to take contaminants home, you need that industrial laundry, there are hybrid programs most everybody is sophisticated enough today to cover all your needs in one program. And then when you do roll out, take advantage of training. Training should be at no charge. Training should be in conjunction with your program. Training should be uh, unbiased. Training should be 
why you're wearing this stuff, what it can't do, what it can do. It should be helping you in, in fulfilling your 1910, 132 on how to properly don and doff, uh, what it can, what it can't do, demonstrate that you properly wear it, demonstrate all those things, and document it. It should be able to help and assist in doing that uh, compliance component. Uh, so with that, we've got about 13, 14 minutes left. I'm going to uh, turn it over here to Kay shortly. But anything that we don't get to today, the good folks here at AIHA, and thank you so much for allowing us to speak today, always get me those questions. If I don't have the answer, if it's outside my uh, realm of expertise or my knowledge base, I'll definitely get you somebody uh, that can answer it. Uh, for you, and I'll communicate that to you uh, in an email. So with that, back to Kate. Okay, great. Thanks for the presentation, Derek. Uh, looks like, yep, we have about 14 minutes left for questions. Uh, just a reminder, if you'd like to ask a question, please type it into the chat window on the right side of your screen and send it to all panelists. Uh, we do have a couple of questions already. Um, the first one, Derek, is what are ways that we can help make compliance the norm always, not just when it's hot? That's an interesting look because, again, the other side of hot is cold. Uh, some of the things we've got to take into consideration is we're talking about insulation and typically layers there. Some things to be conscious of when it gets cold. The outermost layer has to be flame resistant, arc rated to the hazard, whatever that may be. Uh, but as we go through our work day and we go from uh, parts of the world where it's minus 20 and then it starts to warm up and warm up is relative, it gets to, you know, plus 20 at noon, we're working throughout that day. We want to avoid sweating during the cold, so we're going to be doffing layers in order to manage and regulate our body temperature. We've got to make sure those subsequent layers that we are exposing to the hazard can protect the hazard. They've been tested to the hazard. So as, as we go from outer layer that might have some uh, DWR properties where we're, we're stopping the, the moisture getting through, whether that's rain, sleet, or snow, and then we go down to our, our medium layer, which might be a fleece, that's got to have flame-resistant arc-rated properties. And then as it heats up again during the day, we're now doffing our fleece to where we're down to our work shirt and what our base layer. All those layers that we bring into uh, bear there or we exposed as they become the outermost layer must be equal to or greater than the hazard to protect it against. So it's not just hot, it is cold, and, and honestly, everything in between. So as we start putting together that program, we have to look at outer layers, rain gear, base layers, mid layers, it all has to come into play. Okay, great. The next question comes from Gerald, who asks, do all under layers need to be FR rated as well? So, good, better, or best. Uh, and I say that because we do allow within our standards to either wear nothing or wear natural fibers, natural fibers being cotton, wool, especially in our colder months, and silk. Those are all natural fibers, which basically means they will not melt, drip, and add to the injury, assuming that that outermost layer can resist the thermal energy without breaking open and exposing what's underneath. So where does that come into play? In our arc, especially in our arc flash community, you can easily expose that outer layer to incident energies far greater than that outer layer is rated for. Here's what I mean by that. Your calculations are done at 18 inches. If I lean in four, six inches, it doesn't seem like a lot, but my incident energy can go up exponentially, a.k.a. it's five calories of incident energy. I'm wearing an eight-calorie shirt. I'm fine. But when I lean in six inches, that potential energy I haven't calculated for, it may be 18, 24, so it may cause that outer layer to break open and expose what's underneath. If that is a natural fiber, it's also an ignitable fiber. How do I remove that, that good, better, best mentality? I go to a flame-resistant arc-rated base layer. 
Now I take uh, that hazard out of the equation. I take uh, the fact that you wear your big Harley Davidson logo T-shirt underneath out of the equation. I take the fact that you bought white T-shirts thinking that they're 100% cotton and they're actually 50-50. I take that out of the equation. So good, my arc-rated shirt, nothing underneath. Better, my arc-rated shirt with 100% cotton underneath. Best, my arc-rated FR shirt with an arc-rated FR base layer underneath. Okay, thanks, Derek. The next question comes from Daniel, who asks, is there an age limit on FR clothing? I have a 2112 that is about 10 years old, but washed less than five times. Okay, interesting, 10 years old and laundered five times. Uh, regardless of the fiber fabric uh, composition of that, as long as it comes from a manufacturer, and this is the key, wherever it's manufactured, ask for that manufacturer's guarantee in writing or find a place to source what their guarantee is. Is it guaranteed to meet a standard or is it guaranteed for the life of that garment and by life, the useful life of that garment? If your garment sits on the back of your door and you don it periodically to go onto the plant floor or go into production or to go wherever that thermal hazard is and it can hang on that door for five years ten years and i've worn it a half a dozen times a year and i launder it periodically and it's still in good useful condition assuming that the manufacturer guarantees the uh, fr properties for the useful life of that garment you are solid that those FR properties from today's top manufacturers, especially here in the United States, are guaranteed for the life of that garment, and it has nothing to do with the FR properties. The life of that garment is exactly what you would think. Is it becoming threadbare? Are there holes in it? Has it got rips? Has it got tears? And we evaluate all our clothing on a regular basis because we consume clothing and replace it on a regular basis. So same mentality. Okay, thanks. The next question we have is from Vishal, uh, who asks, can flame-resistant clothing lose its flame-resistant properties after many industrial washings? Same, same answer, uh, compartmentalized as the previous answer, depending on who the manufacturer is. And when you look at proven supply chain partners, that means, for example, a manufacturer like us, we evaluate and we work with our mills who produce the fabrics. Those fabrics are tested beyond tested before we ever put our brand on it. That's a brand that's been doing this for 40 plus years. We're not going to put anything out into the marketplace that could potentially fail. Uh, as are with my other colleagues in the top manufacturing class that you would think of. Where do things start getting a little sketchy is when I have a tough time finding out where you're manufactured, when I have a tough time finding out what your test results are, what your compliance is. If I have to pick up a phone and I have to hit a three-digit international code in order to contact you, that would be a red flag. Okay. The next question we have is if we don't use NFPA 2112, what are other options that we can use? None. And, and, I, and, I, and I don't mean to be cavalier on that. First and foremost, what is your hazard? If your hazard is a flash fire, uh, then you should be using 2112 compliant garments because those garments have been built by the manufacturers to protect against that hazard. And that is the only standard out there in North America that you should be following for the flat. If it's just FR, you have no confidence at all on how it obtained that FR designation. It could be FR on some of the most minimalist of testing that has nothing to do with an industrial environment, and they're out there. Uh, so I would caution you that if you have a flash fire hazard and you're looking to protect your people, look to the standard that talks to that, and it's going to say 2112 compliant garments. If you have an arc flash hazard, it's, you're looking at ASTM 1506, and that means that those garments have went through a panel of tests that show it can 
protect and insulate in that uh, violent, short-duration thermal exposure. So I'd be very, very cautious of matching up your hazards with the nationally recognized consensus standards in order to protect your people from that hazard. Okay, great. Thanks, Derek. Um, it looks like that's all the questions that um, we have. So if there aren't any more questions, uh, we'll go ahead and conclude today's webinar. Uh, my thanks to Derek Singh for his presentation, to Bulwark for sponsoring today's webinar, and to all of our participants. Our next Synergist webinar will be held next Wednesday. On November 20th, SGS Galson will present a webinar on EHS air quality monitoring. You can register for this event at aij.webvent.tv. Thanks so much. All right, thank you everyone. This actually concludes today's webcast. Thank you all for attending. The recording will be available at aiha.wetvent.tv. We will send all registrants an email tomorrow with this link. And please visit our event calendar to sign up for future webcasts.